Today we are looking at the 1941 National Farm Survey, an attempt by the wartime government to gather as much information as possible on the condition of the landscape. And it's very impressive, so it's sometimes referred to as the second doomsday book, after the original doomsday book compiled by William the Conqueror after the Norman invasion. And to complement the survey, they made lots of maps. Check this out. Every single farm was outlined in a different colour, sometimes two colours or even a pattern, which makes these maps really pretty. And every single field was marked with its own unique identifying number with its acreage marked below. The entire British landscape was catalogued. So naturally, these maps tell us a lot about patterns of land ownership and land use in the middle of the 20th century. The farms in South Leicestershire, the particular area I'm from, were very small, as you see here and many of them were laid out in a very inefficient way. This is essentially because when the land was enclosed from the medieval open fields into farms as we would understand today, it was overseen by the local squire, the local landowner who owned all the land. Generally speaking, they put the farm houses and farm yards in the villages where presumably the people already lived, but that meant the land associated with these farm yards that farmers could rent were often arranged in strips going away from the village. This is not a very efficient layout because you and your cows will have to walk a very long way to get to the furthest field. Farms outside the villages were much more likely to have an efficient setup, like this one where none of the fields are very far from the yard, although it does have a little block over the road. But you also got farms that were the worst of both worlds, where you had the yard in the village where the machinery would be stored, the people lived and the cows would be milked, but the land was completely separate from that some distance down the road. The inefficiency inherent in this landscape is the context for C.S. Orwin and Daniel Hall's push for land nationalisation. If farms were in strips or had fields scattered all over the place, farmers were wasting time moving stuff around. There was no productive benefit to that. So they wanted to redesign land holdings and clump farms together into bigger units. All of the scientific characters we've been talking about on this channel were really keen on a survey so they would have enough information to fix these problems. C.S. Orwin and Daniel Hall wanted to nationalise the land and redesign all of the land holdings to suit mechanisation and new agricultural technologies. And George Stapledon also wanted surveys to plan new wheat belts and to promote productive farming. But he also wanted surveys for his brand of environmentalism. A survey might reveal where a national park would be best placed and you could plan the green belts to be put round cities. The best survey they'd got before the war was Dudley Stamp's land utilisation survey which basically just noted whether or not land was being ploughed and discovered that most of it wasn't. But with the National Farm Survey carried out by the War Agricultural Executive Committees, these men had what they wanted, an excruciatingly detailed picture of the land in Britain and its infrastructure and the people who worked it. It's a post-war planner's dream. Alongside these maps, you also get a farm survey, which gives a very detailed look at the farm, its business, and the farmer. This is the entry of the farm my family currently have, which at the time was owned by a chap called Arthur Lee, who seemed to have been very good at his job. The survey tells you that he was a full-time farmer, that he didn't have any other interest in land elsewhere. It gives you an assessment of the type of soil, some of it heavy, some of it light, but most medium. The farm is considered conveniently laid out, it has a good position to so the road, railway, the farmhouse is in good condition, the buildings are in good condition, the farm tracks, fences, ditches and drains are all good enough and the workers cottages are also in good condition. It says there are two cottages for workers within the farm area. I genuinely don't know where they would have been, we certainly don't have them anymore. The farm is generally free of infestation, although there are some creeping thistles on some of the grass. And none of the farm is derelict, Mr Lee farms the whole thing. The farm didn't have mains water, the farmhouse and buildings were supplied by wells and the fields were supplied by pits. There was no seasonal shortage of water. The house had an electricity supply but the farm didn't use it. Then they give an assessment of all the farmers. A is outstanding, C requires intervention. Most farmers I've looked at seem to get a B. Mr Lee got an A, which is very good, and there's not much comment here. The condition of his arable land is good to fair, and some of his pasture is also good, but he does have some that is poor that he appears to neglect. But of course he still got an A, which implies the government was not that concerned about neglected pasture, provided the arable side of the enterprise was meeting demand. And accordingly he uses enough fertiliser on his arable land, but none at all on the grass. And then the document is signed. On the reverse there's space for additional comment. 
Mr. Lee farms his arable land very well. Most of his grassland is indifferent, and Mr. Lee will probably practice alternate husbandry, which is the correct policy on this farm. Mr. Lee milks a good herd of cows and is a prominent fattener of pigs. Output from the farm in all branches except the grassland is high. And beneath that, they have details of specific grass fields ploughed up by this point in the war, which usually isn't very many. On top of this, the survey also looked at the different types of power each farm had access to, how many labourers it employed, whether or not they were family and their genders, how many casual or seasonal labourers it used. It looked at water wheels, steam engines, gas engines, motors. In this case, Mr. Lee had one six horsepower stationary engine and one quarter of a horsepower electric motor. And with the great push for mechanisation in British agriculture, as an A farmer, it was to be expected that Mr. Lee would have a 22 horsepower Fordson tractor. The holding was owned by Mr. Lee, but an estimate of its rental value was given at £205. So the British land landscape was being given a monetary value, and Mr Lee had been at the farm for 16 and a half years. The estimation of rental values is very important because the government would need to know what the land was worth if they were going to nationalise it or something. The survey also looks at fruit and market gardening, although most farms didn't really do much of this. Mr Lee just had eight tonnes of hay and two tonnes of straw stored on the farm. And the survey also looks at all of the crops and livestock on that particular farm. In this case, 24 acres of wheat, 64 acres of oats. It asks if there's any legumes being grown. Mr Lee has one acre of potatoes and for his animals he grows two acres of turnips, two acres of mangolds and an acre and a half of kale. It asks about mustard for ploughing in, flax for fibre, orchards or different types of orchards or small fruit. It asks if any of the land is fallow and records the amount of grass for mowing, 18 acres, and permanent grass for grazing, 32 acres. And in total, the farm is 185 acres. Like most farmers coming out of the agricultural depression, Mr Lee was careful not to put all of his eggs in one basket. He had 16 cows and heifers in milk, two cows in calf, one bull and a handful of other cattle, bringing his total to 48. He also had some sheep, 35 over one year old, with 58 lambs, bringing the total up to 93. For pigs, he had one barren sow, 196 pigs over five months old, and a handful a bit younger than that, bringing the total to 205. He had 77 chickens and three ducks, so 80 birds. He has four workhorses, one unbroken horse, and one young horse intended for heavier work. If you look at the letter from the Ministry to the Chairman of the War Ags who undertook the survey, it says the survey is to determine the means whereby each individual farm can best contribute to increased food production. The survey is very utilitarian. It doesn't talk about the quality of food necessarily, just the amount. It wants more calories being produced. It says that farmers ranked A, farm well, B, farm moderately, and C, farm badly. The survey would identify land for improvement either by ploughing, reseeding back to grass, any other work that was necessary, or specifically mole drainage, tile drainage, or clearing out ditches. And farmers might be told to apply specific fertilisers like lime to particular fields. The intention of this survey was that with its findings, scientific methods could be enforced. These surveys reveal the attributes that the government thought made a good farmer. Farmers ranked A tended to be more amenable to ploughing. They tended to have more arable land than pasture compared to the B farmers. And A farmers would be more likely to make use of new technologies like machines and full use of fertiliser. But it wasn't always quite that simple. This is my great-great-grandfather's survey, and he, like Mr Lee, was considered a good farmer. He was a tenant of a slightly larger farm than Mr Lee had. His farm was considered a useful farm, well-farmed, producing quite a lot of food. That was what the government wanted. He was a tenant at Lavender Hall Farm near Berkswell in Warwickshire, marked out here in yellow. His brother was a tenant next door at Ram Hall Farm, marked out in blue. And if you compare their farm surveys, they're very similar, they're both very capable farmers, but his brother didn't get an A, he got a B plus because of lack of cooperation with the war ag. Just being a good farmer on your own wasn't necessarily enough, there were lots of other social factors at play. Quite often the surveys would be brutal, this guy got a C because of personal failings. 
He dislikes hard work. Or this farmer who got a B because his heart is not in ploughed land, which is likely a very British understatement. Temperament is quite a common one. Sometimes they really go to town on people. Lack of initiative and unwilling to employ sufficient labour, which is then expanded on, on the reverse of the page. Production restricted by inefficiency and shortage of capital. The grassland is badly grazed. Production of the arable land is low and little milk is produced for sale. Two sons help Mrs Burroughs, but their farming is of the rough and ready type. No additional labour is employed, the whole idea behind their system of farming being to spend as little as possible in the course of their farming operations. They want full-time farmers, it's a job, you have to devote yourself to it, so this guy doing it in his spare time is not good enough. But they're keen to foster improvement. We hear from this Mr Barnett occasionally in the oral testimonies I use on the channel. The survey says the whole of the arable land on this farm is newly broken up, so is in fair condition. Mr Barnett lacks knowledge but is keen and energetic. So the survey doesn't necessarily think that he's a particularly good farmer, but he has the potential and that is the most important thing. And there are lots of examples like that. Mr Hill was a sea farmer but has improved very considerably. Originally critical of direct reseeding, the Atfields are now enthusiastic about this method of grassland improvement and have done a field in 1940 and 1941. This is what the government wanted. The deployment of agricultural scientists onto farms with the war ag was improving how farming was done. And the surveys also identified problems beyond the farmer's control that the war ag could perhaps fix. In this instance, the farm couldn't really be ploughed up because it was subject to flooding. So the survey suggests the floodgates are put back in working order. I understand these surveys are being digitised at the moment, so if you're interested in family history or your local area, you should be able to look them up on the National Archives website within a couple of years. I had to actually go to the archives to take these pictures. Original research in a YouTube video, that's worth a subscribe. I hope you enjoyed that. Do join me next week where I think we'll be having a look at people who suffered as a result of these surveys, and also Lord Limington, because he's everywhere. I'll see you then.